yeah it is started recording so welcome back and uh, uh, let's continue so uh, we have uh, finished uh, the construction of lebesgue measure and uh, we also did uh, all the prop all the important properties of lebesgue measure so let's uh, quickly recall what is the key point in the construction if if you are allowed to say only one word out of which we got lebesgue measure what is that raised representation yeah. raised representation yeah rrt yes and uh, then uh, what were the main points yeah so the next important concept was i mean how, where did you apply raised representation theorem so that you needed a positive linear functional and how did you get that thing how did you get the positive linear functional on which you apply the raised representation theorem by the notion of riemann integration yeah so you use so one word answer is riemann i mean two word answer is riemann integration right by uh, so where we have we have to construct a measure and uh, in order to construct the measure you are applying you need to get a positive linear functional where on which vector space this positive linear yeah. function is, uh, is on which vector space r d hmm? no r d is your euclidean space of course it's a vector space but the linear functional is not on r d no the space of all continuous function this yeah ccx ccx so ccrk ccrk yeah we used the k dimensional ccrk and uh, so you have to define a linear function so take a fun take a vector in ccx so a function right continuous function of compact support f and you have to define capital lambda of f and that was just the riemann integral of f right and on this you apply rrt in fact you can apply the better rrt right what do you mean by better rrt what could i possibly mean by sigma, better rrt sigma, sigma, sigma compact. compact because rk is sigma compact and therefore you get a measure which is now automatically complete from the usual rrt but also automatically outer regular also from the usual rrt but also because of the sigma compact rrt it is also hmm regular in a regular yeah so are you changing your screen no i have not i am still uh, talking yeah i will i should i should okay so good for reminding me let me start sharing the screen up to now what did you see your video yes my video right so let yeah. me uh, so thanks for reminding let me share the screen and uh, then we will continue this talk for some more time uh, by the way feel free to ask me you don't have to put it in chat once you know i am sharing the screen i don't see your chat okay so for now can you see the screen yes yes sir yes okay. now onwards i will not see the chat uh, earlier i was on ms team so i could see uh, the chat message now i will not see so now if you have to ask me something you have to unmute and ask yeah so uh, we are recalling uh, this thing it proved a number of properties yeah so sigma compact rrt so it is regular regular meaning both outer regular and inner regular so you have got a measure which is complete and regular and because of sigma compact rrt sandwiching is better right i don't know better is the word but yeah you have several forms of sandwiching uh, what are the three sandwiching results that you have now one is the one which already came in usual rrt which is that if you are in mf and what is mf mf is uh, mf is uh, we have the characterization all lebesgue yeah here it is going to be lebesgue measure all lebesgue measurable sets of finite measure so if the measure is finite what is a basic sandwiching that you know you can put compact inside and open outside such that the differences arbitrarily small given an epsilon i can choose v and k so is that measure of v minus k v and k and this measurable set e is sandwiched in between and the difference of uh, v minus k the measure is as small as you want i mean given epsilon make it less than epsilon okay and then because of sigma compact what is another uh, sandwiching that you have and just recall it state of uh, having mm -hmm. compact set 
you will take it both Close. can make it close and open is still open and still you can make it less than epsilon then you have a measure zero sandwiching yes which is f sigma and g delta yeah instead of close you can make it f sigma instead of open you can make it g delta and the difference is zero and this result you saw we have used many many times right in proving some of these properties uh, so yeah, F sigma and D delta, and in particular, these are Burrell sets. And uh, we proved several properties, proving for Burrell first, and then proving it in general using this particular property. And what are the most important properties that we proved? One important property is translation invariant. A measurable set is translation invariant, and the measure is also translation invariant. And another important property that we proved is it is unique up to multiplication by a non-negative scalar, any translation invariant okay. measure. And there was a technical condition, no? What was the technical condition? Any translation invariant measure satisfying? What was the extra hypothesis? Then you got uniqueness. Do you remember? Volume finite unbox. Volume finite on? On boxes. Boxes? No, in the, in the, in the, see, in the, the statement had no boxes. Boxes was only in the proof. So volume finite is correct. But the way you stated volume finiteness, you demanded on? Compact sets, is that true? Compact. Compact sets. So then uh, it is unique up to multiplication by a positive scalar. You remember the proof? What was that positive scalar finally? Given mu, you have to prove that it is C times M. What was that C? You remember it came in the proof. The volume of the unit box. Volume of a unit box under this measure mu. And therefore it is, uh, of course, non-negative. Okay. And uh, correct. And in that proof, we use translation variance crucially, right? Which I did not stress first, and then I came back and stressed, right? You take a box and you write it as, you take an N box and you write it as a union of one boxes and observe that each of these boxes is translation variant of each other, and then the proof followed by additivity. And then another important property was connecting with the determinant, no? What was the statement? Yes, yes. Connecting with the determinant. So in order to have a determinant, what do you have? Determinant of what? Determinant of a? Linear transformation. Linear transformation or a matrix. So, so the statement was, if you have a linear transformation, then uh, take a measurable set, then T of E is also measurable, and M of T of E and M of E differs by, what was the notation? A positive non-negative constant. What was the notation? Delta T. Capital Delta T of T. And later we made the remark that Delta T is nothing but determinant. absolute value of the determinant of, T. determinant of T. And what was the idea in proving these two results? Uniqueness up to a scalar and then this particular result. What was the main idea? So earlier you had to prove that mu is c times m. Mu is c times m. So or translation invariance. In order to prove translation invariance, m of e plus x is m of x. What was the main idea? There was one idea and then everything followed. You define a new measure. Right? If you define the measure lambda by lambda of e equal to m of e plus x, now you have two measures lambda and m and then you have to show that these two are equal and here what was the main idea in order to show that two positive borel measures are equal what do you need to show so on open set no they are uh, yeah on open sets and in particular it is enough to show they are equal on boxes boxes and how did we show that these two are equal on boxes well that was obvious right no, not obvious because of our previous observation that the Lebesgue measure coincides with on a on a KSL, 
Lebeg measure is same as what? Volume. 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 And because of that, you know that this new measure and M, both of them coincide on boxes and therefore on open sets and therefore on burial sets and uh, therefore on all Lebeg measurable sets. So this is how we proved all these things. And the last part I asked you to check that delta T is same as mod of delta T. What was the key observation? In order to check this. We had a reduction step, right? We said that it is enough to check on elementary matrices, elementary linear transformations. And what was the reduction step? And you know, right? Any, I mean, elementary linear algebra tells you that any matrix can be written as a product of elementary matrices. Elementary matrices. So we are saying that it is enough to check for elementary matrices. Therefore, the reduction step is to show that delta of T1, T2 is delta of T1 times delta of T2. And determinant, of course, that property is true. And delta of T1, T2 is delta of T1 times delta of T2 is obvious or hard? Is it easy or is it hard? Easy. We have to apply it. It's yeah, it's easy, right? You just apply. So measure of t1 t2 of e by definition is delta of t1 t2 times measure of e on the other hand m of t1 t2 of e is m of t1 of t2 of e so delta t1 comes out first and then delta t2 comes so it's a product okay so these are all the things that we did last time and uh, now today you know i'm going to have a not so much i will cover i will just state and prove lucent's theorem and uh, I should just tell you uh, some some small assignment for you just to Google. OK, so there is Lucent's theorem and there is another theorem from MSC you might remember, which goes hand in hand with Lucent. Not that that result has so much to do with Lucent, but the statements are very similar. What is it called? That's also a famous name theorem. With Lucent, you would always remember one more theorem, name theorem. What is that? Say something, you could be wrong, it's okay. I have not read so much. Okay, no, but those of you who had uh, measure theory in MSc with Lucin, uh, roughly around the time you would have done one more theorem, which also has a name. By the way, both these people are teachers of Urison. You remember Urison, right? We discussed uh, his uh, uh, biography a little bit. What do you remember about Urison? Is there anything that immediately you recall from what we discussed? I think I think he died in very short age. Yeah, I think that was very striking. He and do you recall how? At a very young age, and it was an accident. Yeah, swimming and incident. So I think uh, you please double check. But Lucin and Egorov. Egorov. Egorov is the other one. Egorov's theorem. You remember Egorov from MSc? E-G-O-R-O-F-F -F in many places, maybe R-O-V in some other places. R-O-F-F, -F, let's say, Egorov. Okay, so do you recall Lucent's theorem? The statement, roughly, in plain English, what it is? Or what are the key, key players in the theorem? What is it about? Is it about uh, sets? Is it about functions? Is it about convergence or something? What is it about? It's about something convergence or something. So there is a famous convergence result. I think that is Egorov's theorem. Convergence in major and convergence. Yeah, in that is Egorov. That is Egorov. So Lucin is something similar. Now, do you recall Lucin? Approximating by a, a CCX function. Yeah. So what can be approximated? A complex measurable function. Yeah, correct. So a measurable function is like a continuous function. This is Lucent and Egorov says that. Uh, if you have, you know, if you are in the right setup, then there's not there's only a small difference between point wise convergence and uniform convergence. In the in the in the sense of measure. OK, so the small exercise that I want to tell you, I think I when I read about it in Wikipedia, I read that it is mentioned in Royden's book. Maybe Rodin doesn't mention it. You know, do you recall something? I mean, uh, how many of you followed Royden in MSc? R-O-Y-D-E-N? Did anyone have a look at Royden? 
sir, for functional eigen. Okay, this this book on measure theory. Apparently, Royden mentions it. Otherwise, you can Google. Do you know this name, Littlewood, mathematician? Littlewood. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. And uh, do you recall something uh, related to all these things about Littlewood? Three principles. Yeah, three principles. So Littlewood's three principles. Uh, one of them is basically Lucent's theorem, which says that measurable function and continuous function are very close. I mean, measurable function is nearly a continuous function. Okay, you Google and read it exactly as he said. Okay, so we will discuss this, and uh, the setup is that of RRT. So what does that mean? Your spaces, your spaces X, which is um, uh, locally compact Hausdorff. Locally compact Hausdorff, and uh, then yeah, so locally compact Hausdorff, and a measure you get a measure satisfying all those properties. So mu is complete, mu is outer regular. We don't have inner regular, but uh, we have this MF, which is sets of finite measure, which also have inner regularity, right? Sets of finite measure also have inner regularity. And then what else was there? So complete and uh, outer regular and inner regular and representation doesn't matter because there's no functional here. So is there one more property that I'm missing? Other than representing, we stated four properties, no? Ah, finite on compact sets. Finite on compact sets, inner regular on finite measure sets, outer regular and complete. Okay, so mu satisfies all these properties. So this is the place. And now f is a measurable function, a complex measurable function. And support of f is contained in a set of finite measure. This is hypothesis in Lucent's theorem. Okay. So uh, support, I'm not saying compact support. I'm only saying support is contained inside a set of finite measure. Will it make it automatically compact support? Or maybe not. Contained inside a set of finite measure will not make it compact support, no? Will it? What do you say? If X is R, then it will automatically make support the compact. Suppose X is R, suppose X is R, and uh, support is contained in a set of finite measures, what you have. Does it make support to be compact? The finite measure does it in the bounded set. A bit louder, I can't hear you properly. Yeah, I mean, uh, finite measure doesn't mean this is a bounded set. Like then yeah, bounded, but sets of finite measure need not be bounded, no? Yes, no, then we cannot say that. Yeah, compact. so we can't say in general. So this is all that we assume that if is support is contained inside a set of finite measure, then this is the statement given epsilon. There is a G. So what is given to you is F and there is a G. Which is in CCX continuous of compact support. F is just a measurable function. F is not continuous, need not be continuous need not have compact support, but support is contained inside a set of finite measures given. When given epsilon, there is a continuous function of compact support such that, what do you want to say? F and Z are nearly identical. What does that mean? The points where they differ, the points of X where F and Z differ, that is really small. And how do you make that statement? Statement is? Mod of Mod of minus not mod, the measure. The measure of x is that oh, f and z yes. differ. That is less than epsilon. So you are giving me epsilon, I will find a g. You give me a small epsilon, I will find a g such that the difference has measure less than epsilon. So this is a good approximation, right? This is Lucent's theorem. Okay, so let's recall the proof. And uh, it has also one more statement which is very, very useful and it, it follows from the same proof. We may arrange it. So what can we arrange? We are constructing this G and we can choose the G so that, do you remember this uh, inequality in Lucent? You can also choose this G such that you can maintain an inequality, which is supremum of mod GX is less than or equal to supremum of mod FX. Okay, we will see in the proof. This can be, this can be easily done. So this is Lucent's theorem. 
And one remark is that a consequence of this later is that if you take LP mu, what is LP mu? All those functions. P P integrable. P integrable. Integral x mod f power P d mu is finite. And actually when we say P mu, it's up to an equivalence, right? Two, two functions are uh, equivalent if uh, they are the same almost everywhere. OK, because it's about integration. So anyway, so the point is CCX is dense in LP mu, and this is going to be a consequence of this. Right, because in LP mu, if you take a function F, then of course it's measurable and it can be approximated by CCX. We may need to give a one line argument, but essentially Lucent's theorem uh, implies this. OK, CCX is dense in LP mu, which is going to be a very useful result. Let's do the proof, but uh, one one important point in the proof is, you know, something that we have done long back. This is page five of lecture two. copy paste it. OK, it starts with uh, this can be explicitly achieved. So this is not about the previous slide. This is, you know, copy pasted of page five of lecture two. So this is about page four of lecture two. Do you remember? Uh, do you feel what this could be lecture two at the starting? What we could have done? Yes, what is given to you is a measurable function and I am recalling this result and we are going to apply this result. Do you remember given a measurable function what we could have done so early in our course? Approximated by a simple function. Simple functions in a particular way, right? S1 less than or equal to S2 less than or equal to etc. So let me quickly go through it. What we did was this particular construction. I'm not going to read all this out. So what was the main idea? What is this 5-1 and all that? There was you know, something that I skipped in page 4. What was the main point? Given a function on some arbitrary space X, what was the main idea there? F is a function from X to 0 to infinity. Close 0, closed infinity. What was the key step? And all these things we are doing where? See, f is a function from x to 0 to infinity, x to 0 infinity. What was the first step? And then we did this particular construction. You can see this is all copy pasted. You know, these constructions we did. But where are we doing these constructions? And what was the reduction step? So when I say this can be explicitly achieved, what is this? Is what I'm asking. You remember? The very first step f is from x to 0 infinity. And this particular construction that we are doing is not from x to 0 infinity, right? What is this construction? Nobody remembers? I think to approximate the identity constant is something. Yes, 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 absolutely. So we are, what we are going to do is so we say that it is enough to approximate identity function from where to where. Identity function is from R to R. R to R, but not R to R. Zero to infinity is what we are considering. Close zero, close to infinity. And then of course it follows because if you know that can be approximated by simple functions, phi one less than or equal to phi two less than or equal to etc. What you have to do is just compose with F. That will also be simple and the monotonic monotonicity is preserved. OK, and this was the construction. You know, we did a particular construction and we got phi one and phi two. And I said, similarly, you do define phi n in a similar fashion. OK, so it was an explicit construction and uh, we claimed all these things. Identity function is approximated by this. So this I have recalled because. If T is between zero and one here, T was anything between zero and infinity, right? T up to two, you define like this. Then up to 2 to infinity, you define like this. Phi 3, what was the definition? Up to 0 to 3, you will define in a way, and 3 to infinity, you define another way. So like this, you construct it. Now I'm interested only in the area, in the length 0 to 1. OK, so 0 to 1, how much you have to pay attention to? This much only, no? Agree? Yes. 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 And uh, phi 1, 0 to 1 is just this much. Just this much. So phi 1 is just this much and phi 2 is just this much. And can you tell what phi 3 will be? 
What is the pattern? Up to one only you are looking at. So how many components will be there in phi three? One by eight, two by eight, and one by eight, two by eight, up to seven by eight. Seven by eight and the corresponding intervals, characteristic yes. functions. Seven things mm -hmm. will be there. Actually, eight things. The first thing you don't see because it is zero. Okay. So like this, if you do. And then if you multiply appropriately by two, four, etc. And if you take the reduction, this was the first observation. So twice phi one is chi times. Chi, no, chi of half one. That is clear, right? Because phi one is half chi this thing. So twice phi one is this characteristic function. Now you do phi two minus phi one. Can you do phi two minus phi one and tell me what it is? This is phi two and phi one is half. I half one. So what is phi two minus phi one? So this part is remaining, right? Half one, you will uh, remove something, but this is remaining, right? Yes. If you subtract phi one, this remains. What happens yeah. to this part? This goes away, right? Half to three yeah. by four will go away. And here, three by four to one, you are subtracting half. Yes. Half you are subtracting. So what remains? One by four. One by four. So if you multiply the difference by four, what will you get? You will get characteristic function of one by four to one by two union three by four to one. That in between thing went away. Okay. Similarly, you can see eight times phi three by phi two will also be a characteristic function of these intervals. There's a pattern. Okay. The point is, if you do these things, if you do phi n minus phi n minus one in that construction. And multiply that by two power n. It is a single characteristic function of some set, which may be union of intervals like this. Make that observation from that proof. And uh, for f from x to zero to infinity, you define s n to be phi n composed f and checked all these things and limit s n as f. And if you take t n to be s n minus s n minus one, what is this observation? This observation tells you that if zero less than or equal to f less than one, two power n t n. Is a characteristic function of a particular set. Okay, so phi n of so for identity function that set is a union of intervals. When you come to when you compose with this, it will be some other set. Okay, so it's one set characteristic function of one set which we are calling T n capital T n. Okay. And now the observation is if you sum up these things, fx is summation tnx. Uh, what is the proof of this? fx is summation tnx. Why is this true? Because, because what is tn? Partial tn is tn, tn minus tn, tn minus 1, and summation tnx is fx is same as saying limit of partial sum. Right? Partial sums of summation TNX is exactly SN, no? That's a construction, right? So what you have done here is given measurable function, you have written as an infinite series where these TNs are TNs of characteristic functions. Essentially characteristic functions up to 2 power n. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. TNs are characteristic functions, basically. OK, so this is the first achievement. So this achieve this is the first step and this step required the specific construction that we did. OK, so given measurable function, what is our aim? What is the aim of Lucent's theorem? Measurable function is given to you and what do you need to construct? You need to construct a continuous function of compact support appropriately, right? Yes. So what you have done here is if you have written as a series. So what is your hope? Each Tn you get a corresponding continuous function of compact support and then how do you get G? You sum it up. Of course you have to check that the sum makes sense, sum is also continuous etc. But that can be done. So this is the reduction step. If you think of it as a series, a sum of particular kind of functions, each of this particular kind of function you get a continuous function of compact support sum it up there and hopefully you know everything works out well. This is the idea of the proof. OK, this is the first step. Now it is given to you that is uh, support of F is contained in a finite measure set, right? And that is very, very crucial. 
and we are going to use that. So let A be such that support of if is contained in A with mu A finite. Mu A finite is very important for the proof. This is what is given to you. So we are starting Lucent's proof. And first we do the case. I'm going to assume F is bounded. F is any arbitrary measurable function. I'm going to assume that F is bounded. I'm also going to assume that A is compact. Compact sets are finite measure. So this is a sub case, right? If you have to do any set of finite measure, first you are going to do compact. Also, F is bounded. Now, if F is bounded, where did I do this construction of summation T and what was the condition on F? What is the condition on F on which you made this observation? F is between 0 and 1. Yeah, F is between 0 and 1. Here, my assumption is F is bounded. But do you agree that we may, without loss of generality, assume that F is strictly less than 1? If F is bounded? So divide by that constant. Divide by that constant, get a CCX function there, and finally multiply that CCX function by this constant. That's enough, no? Continuous function times the constant is also a continuous function of compact support. So this is without loss of generality. Therefore, you know that F is summation TNX, and that TN is the set such that, what is capital TN from the previous slide? Is a set such that? TN is. The characteristic function of Tn is 2 power n Tn, yeah. right? So this is the set Tn, and what we are going to do is fix an open set V such that A is contained in V and V bar is compact. Tell me why we can do this. This is this can be done because X is locally compact. X is locally oh, compact, housed off. And we had a particular result. Whenever you have, whenever you have k contained in u, k compact u open, you can get a v with v bar compact, such that k is contained in v is contained in v bar is contained in u. So you have used the compactness and got a v, such that a is contained in v and v bar is compact. So this is long ago we have done this. And I'm going to take compact KN and open VN such that KN is contained in TN is contained in VN is contained in V. So, and the difference of measure of VN minus KN is arbitrarily small. So, KN and VN you can always get so that the measure, the difference of the measure is arbitrarily small. How do you make that VN contained in this V? You can always get such a VN, but how can you choose that VN to be contained inside V? What is the argument for this step? We will take intersection with V. Yeah, just take intersection. Absolutely. So if you have got KN and WN, such so that KN contained in TN contained in WN, measure of WN minus KN is small, just take VN to be WN intersection V. And WN intersection V contains TN because TN is contained in A and V also contains A. Okay, so this is fine. And if VN is contained in WN and WN minus KN measures arbitrarily small, this is also arbitrarily small. So this is okay. Now what we are going to do is apply Urizon. Apply Urizon to KN contained in VN and get HN. Can you feel the proof? The measurable function f corresponding to that you have got tn's right the function tn and corresponding to that thing somehow you have got a function hn so can you tell me what g should be f is summation tn and corresponding to tn you've got hn so what should be g summation hn Summation HN, right? Summation HN properly adjusted. You know, you will see that there is a 2 power N involved and properly adjusted, you are going to take summation 2 power minus N HN. See, summation HN is good, but you know, summation HN, how do you know whether it converges? Series should be convergent, yeah. right? In fact, series should be uniformly convergent. Only then you can assume that G is continuous, no? In order to get G to be continuous, you need uniform convergence. But this is good, no? This is convergent and uh, this is continuous. Why is this continuous? Why why is the series convergent? Because n -th term is less than one. Yeah, n term is less than yeah, less than a constant which is less than one here. 
so nth term is small so this is convergent and therefore this is a continuous function so it's uniformly convergent and uh, uniform if you have a series which is uniformly convergent of continuous functions and the sum is continuous no yes yes and uh, is is g ccx is g compact support all legends are compact supported so say that again all legends are compactly supported yes Is that enough? No, sir. I think. If it was a finite sum, then that was enough, no? Yes, infinite. Yes. And uh, infinite sum, convergence is there. Uh, support is in real. What happens for finite sum? If f and g are of compact support, why f plus g is of compact support? Because support of f. is compact support of g is compact and f plus g is what can you say about support of f plus g support of f union contained in contained in some of contained in support of f union support of g and when you take bar a union b bar is contained in a bar union b bar and the finite union of compact sets is compact so finite union of compact is compact is used there uh here you can't use that Okay, we'll come back to it. I'm also skipping it. Uh, no, but maybe you know we know this already. I did not think of it yesterday when I was preparing, but uh, it is also of compact support. After all, we are claiming G is of compact support, right? So yeah, you know something else. You know something else. You know, no, no, this is fine because H N you know is supported in in this notation. Support of H N is contained in B N D. Pn and therefore uh, summation H n support is contained in union of V n, no? Yes. Infinite union of V n. Infinite union. That's okay. Infinite union of V n, right? And that is contained in a compact set. Why? V n are subset of V. Subset of V and therefore, therefore you cannot say infinite sum is contained in V. And infinite sum is certainly contained in v bar. v bar. V bar. But that's where we will use this thing that v bar is compact. Therefore, g is of compact support. Is that clear? So, suppose if g is contained inside v bar, therefore g is of compact support. So, it is a continuous function of compact support. Now, what do you have to show? You have to show that the places where f and g differ. What do you have to show? Places where f and g differ. That measure is small. Arbitrary. Small. Small. Yeah. So since each v n is inside v, okay. So this is coming. Support of g is contained in v bar, and now we are going to note that two power minus n h n is t n. Where? Not everywhere, but this is certainly true in what places? T n is the characteristic function of T n, and H n is identically one on K n. K n is contained in T n, so on K n this is true, no? Yes. Two power okay. minus n H n is same as T n on K n, right? Agree? Yes. What is the left hand side on K n? Left hand side on K n is two power minus n. Tn two power n Tn is a characteristic function of Tn, and Kn is contained on Tn. Therefore, the right hand side is also two power minus n. So this is certainly true in Kn, and this is certainly true outside Vn, no? Outside Vn also this is true. Why? Because outside Vn what is left hand side? Zero. Zero. And Tn also is zero outside Vn. Why? Because T n is contained in V n, because capital T n is contained in V n. So this is true, except in V n minus K n. On K n, this is true. Outside V n, also this is true. So this is true, except in V n minus K n. But what do you know about V n minus K n? What is the measure? 
less than epsilon by 2 to the power n. Yes, and therefore gx equal to fx except in union vn minus kn. And what is the measure of union vn minus kn? That is less than or equal to yes, summation of measures. And that summation is summation epsilon by 2 power n, which is epsilon. So you got gx equal to fx except in a set of measure less than epsilon. Okay, so beautiful proof. Uh, you reason we are using and one or two key ideas. And uh, this is the proof of Lucin when with the assumption, what are, what are the assumptions? F is bounded and compact. A is compact. A is compact. So now, do you see the typo here? Just a tech question. If you know LaTeX, you don't see the typo in PDF, but I can feel the typo on my fingertips. Can you see? What is the number coming down when I click this? Sixty-three. 63 now 64 now 65 without doing anything so yeah. can you get the typo is repeated slide yeah so you know i mean i'm getting these pauses by typing slash pausc slash pause so i must have had an extra slash pause which i'll give it okay now let a be any set of finite measure so f is still bounded and A is any set of finite measure. Can you guess what should be the proof? If it's a set of finite measure, then? We will uh, approximate it by compact set. Why? It is correct, but why? Because why is that? finite measure sets are in a regular. Finite measure sets are in MF. That's a characterization and MF is in a regular. Yes. So since A is in MF and it uh, follows from sandwiching, that mu of A minus K can be made arbitrarily small by choosing compact K contained in A, right? Once A is in MF, you have the sandwiching. You can choose compact K contained in A, contained in V, such that mu of V minus K is arbitrarily small. Therefore, mu of A minus K is arbitrarily small. So you can choose such a K. Now for a measurable F, you define Bn to be the set of all X such that mod Fx is bigger than N. Then you observe that B1 contains, B2 contains, etc. And intersection of Bn is empty set, right? Mod Fx is bigger than N for every N. So that means there's nothing like that. So this is empty set. Now can you believe, can you guess what the next conclusion should be? One you have, once you have a descending chain, what is the result that you will use? So there must be a finite number of sets. Intersection is also no, there is a basic uh, result about measure of Bn. Measure of Bn will converge to what? So measure of 5. Measure of 5, which is 0. And uh, you can use that result provided you know that measure of B1 is finite. B1 is and finite. is that true? Measure of B1 is finite. Is that true? Why is it true that measure of B1 is finite? Only then you can use it. Because, because FX, is FX, FX, FX is between 0 to 1. F is so not F between is 0 to 1, F is bounded. Yeah, bounded. But, uh, but that doesn't mean that doesn't mean measure of B1 is finite, no? Because B1 is set of all X is that mod Fx is bigger than 1. But that set may have infinite measure, no? Even if f is bounded, you may get f bigger than mod f is bigger than 1 and mod f is bounded by some m. So what? Yes. It's not a Lebesgue measure, right? It is some arbitrary measure. So you have an annulus in uh, and you are taking set of all x. Even if you have a Lebesgue measure, that's on C. You have set of all x on some arbitrary measure space. Why should you know mod f x bigger than 1 and 2? Why should that have finite measure? But you know that B1 has finite measure. Why? Look at the slide carefully. It is underlined. Yes. A is because A is a, I mean, your full set A is of finite measure. 
And outside A, what do you know about F? What is the value of F outside A? Zero. Zero. Therefore, D1 is contained inside A, no? Yes. And uh, measures have monotonicity. So measure of D1 is finite, so you can apply that result. It follows that mu of Dn goes to zero. OK, so what you have concluded is. If you take this function, one minus characteristic function of Dn times F, then outside Dn, these two are same, right? By construction, outside Dn, F and the right hand side are same, no? Yes, because last one. And, uh, yes, and the right hand side function has a nice property that it is bounded. 1 minus chi bn times f. What can you say about that function? Uh, outside bn it coincides with f. And where is it bounded, the outside function? On bn it is bounded, right? On bn. No. On on Bn, what can on, on Bn? What is the right hand side? On Bn, the right hand side is zero, right? Yes. It's on A minus Bn. Huh? A minus Bn. Uh, F is non zero. No, I'm just saying that out on Bn, the right hand side is zero, right? Yes. And outside Bn, what can you say about the right hand side? Outside Bn, what do you know about F? Outside Bn, what is F? F is less than is equal to n. Mod, mod f is less than n. Therefore, yes. outside bn, the right hand side is bounded, right? Yes. And everywhere out right hand side is bounded, therefore, because on bn it is zero. Right? The right hand side function is bounded. Therefore, you can apply the previous uh, a, a step up to now what we have done, you can apply, no? We have proved it for all bounded functions, right? We have proved it for all bounded functions, assuming A is compact. Assuming yes, A is this. compact. But uh, what is uh, uh, can you think of a compact set out, outside which the right hand side is zero? It is bounded and uh, on BN it is zero, right? On B and it is zero. So the right hand side makes sense only in the region mod fx is less than or equal to n, right? X says that mod fx is less than or equal to n. You agree? Hmm? Yes, sir. Yeah, because if mod fx is bigger than n, then the right hand side is zero. Continue B. Right, if X is in BN, if mod FX is bigger than N, then X is in BN, and therefore the right hand side is zero. So right hand side is non-zero. The same as saying X says that mod FX is less than or equal to N. But why are you getting, let me go ahead. It is bounded and does the previous claim applies. This is not quite correct, no? We have not found a compact set. Yeah, so we have to we have to do a little bit more, which is that which is that between A and K it is arbitrarily small anyway. So what yeah, what what I will do is I need a compact set. Yes, I can restrict my attention to this compact set K. OK, so consider this equality on K. That's OK, no? K is, you know, something which is very near A from inside by inner regularity. And on K, you consider this. This function, the right hand side function, you consider on K, the compact set K. On compact set, you can apply, right? Yes. No. 
but I have to say, I have to get a compact set outside which this is zero. So give me a compact set outside which this is zero. So outside the BN, no, in BN this is zero. So outside BN complement this is zero. Outside BN complement this is zero. So if I take right in bn it is zero so outside bn complement sir it, it takes zero. intersection with k bn bn intersection with k bn intersection k or bn complement intersection k okay take bn intersection k but why is that compact because yeah, closer. Closer. Hmm? because closure of bn with intersection k ah, take closure of bn intersection with k fine and outside that what do you know No, so that's that's not good. Yeah. You take you take K intersection, the closure of B and complement. Is that okay? If you take K intersection, the closure of B and complement, that is compact. And outside that, what happens? Zero. The right hand side. Like that. So you're taking BN complement. The closure of that and outside that. That means it is in BN where it is zero, right? Yes, sir. Yes. So apply this on. Yeah, so some small, small steps I have skipped. Apply this on K intersection, the closure of BN complement. There the previous result can be applied, and what do you get? You get that. Yeah, anyway, I'm saying outside BN. So uh, you take K intersection BN complement. So this is BN complement. You take K intersection BN complement closure. There, if you apply the previous result, you will get G such that F not equal to G, that measure is very small. But how does it prove for A itself? Because mu of A minus K is also arbitrarily small. So putting those two together, you are done. Is that okay? On K intersection B and complement the difference between F. There is a G says the difference between F and G are small. You got a G in CCX. Okay. Such that on K intersection B and complement closure, the difference is very small. Now you are taking points in A. But points in A. Outside K only you need to consider because inside K you have already done something. Now outside K and A, the difference is very small anyway. So putting both these things together, it, uh, it proves for, uh, yeah, so you choose N largeness, depending on, you know, how much you have to make, make it small, you choose N large enough so that, uh, So what do you have to do? Sir. Yeah. Why we are taking F is equal to one minus characteristic and some of the in order to get boundedness. In order to get boundedness. Oh. Since uh, we have to find a set on which this function is bounded. you have to get a function which is bounded on a compact set. Uh, you have to get a function which is zero outside a compact set and the function should be bounded. So if you take this difference like this, it is bounded and outside K intersection closure of B and complement, it is zero. So you can apply the previous result and get a G. Now what I'm saying is this is true for any N and if you choose N large enough,
yeah if you if you give me a very small epsilon i will do this argument for a large enough n okay so that no how should i do uh Yes, 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 yes. Sorry, sorry. So I you know I did something else maybe here. I'm, I'm going to use this also. Mu of bn goes to zero. So if you choose, you give me an epsilon. I'll choose n large enough so that mu of bn is less than epsilon. That is true because of this, right? Yes, yes. So if you give me an epsilon, I'll choose n large enough so that mu of bn is very small. And... Uh, mu of bn is very small and on that bn yes so i'm going to get a continuous function of compact support approximating this outside bn and bn has anyway small measure that's enough no Right, I have got a continuous yes. function of compact support G such that G differs from this function. This I am taking outside BN and that is small measure. By the previous result. So you have to look at points inside BN only, but inside BN anyway has small measure because N is large enough. <coughs> so that, that was written without compact. Okay. Is this okay? So here the required uh, approximate function is R over minus. I have, I have defined, see G is anyway in CCX. I'm applying yes. G restricted to K intersection B and complement closure. And there I have got that the difference is really arbitrarily small. So the remaining points are in BN, but BN itself has measure arbitrarily small. Nice, nice. Okay, so combining this together, uh, you are done. So all these uh, BNs are inside A and you are also using A minus K is also arbitrarily small. Yeah, you are using three things being arbitrarily small. Okay, so this does, so what remains? Nothing is remaining, no, Lucin is done, right? Except that you can arrange G so that this inequality is true. Right? And that is easy. What you do is take R to be the supremum of mod Fx. And then take this function phi of Z as if mod Z less than or equal to R identity. And mod Z bigger than R you do this and make the observation that this is a continuous function from C on to the disk of radius R. Okay, so specific function. And then what you do is if G is as in Lucene, you take phi composed with G and you make the observation. So by construction, mod G1 is less than or equal to mod F, right? Mod G is less than or equal to supremum of mod F, right? Mod G1 is less than or equal to supremum of mod F for every X. Therefore, uh, this inequality is true for G1, no? Because R is the supremum. And this image is into the disk of radius R. R is a supremum. So by construction, supremum of mod Gx, supremum of mod G1x is less than or equal to supremum of mod Fx. Agree? Yes. Yeah. Now what, 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 what has to be checked? G1 also satisfies the, uh, the, uh, the result of Lucent. Meaning the points X at which G1 differs from F. That is arbitrarily small. How will yes. you check that? So the points at which phi of g of x is not equal to fx. So using the definition of phi, you check that. Suppose mod gx is bigger than r. If mod gx is bigger than r, then in particular gx is not fx, right? If mod gx is bigger than r. Yes. Then gx is not fx. So that is negligible. gx not equal to fx. And that has small measure. 
OK, so what you have to concentrate is this condition here. Here what might happen is G, GX. Yeah, here what will happen mod GX is less than or equal to R. Phi of G of X is nothing but GX itself. And you know that GX not equal to FX is arbitrarily, I mean small mesh. So either way it is done. OK, so the observation is you take this G1 by construction, this satisfies the inequality and you check that the claim in Lucene is also true for this G1. I so think you can that make, yeah. G1 is equal to F on whole of X. G1 is not uh, R on whole of X. G, G1, G1 is equal of, to F. F. G1 equal to G, F. G, sorry. G1 equal to G where? G1 of G1 of X is phi of G of X. So if mod G X is less than or equal to R, it is G X. If, if mod G X is strictly bigger than R, it is R times G X by mod G X. Yes, yes. Okay. But that is something you don't know, but doesn't matter. You are interested in set of all points X says that G1 X is not F X. That is phi of G of X is not F X. So at the point phi of g of x is g of x, it is same as the set gx not equal to fx about which you know something. And at the points where uh, mod gx is bigger, that is anyway contained in gx not equal to fx. So that also is small mesh. Putting both these together, the claim in Lucene is also true. Okay. There is an important corollary which is applying Lucene together with Burrell Cantilly. Do you recall what is Burrell Cantilly? Yes, sir. Which is? Which is, you uh, have? If we have a sequence of measurable sets huh? and if we define the characteristics for something, uh, infinite sum and which is convergent then. No characteristic function, the measure yes. of EN. Mu of E and summation, if that is finite, then? Then every X belongs to at most finite number of E n's. Not every X. You're right. At most finitely many E n. Every yeah. X belongs to at most finitely many E n. But not every X, no? Because all these came at the last part of chapter one, where all the results were about? Almost every X. Almost every X. Almost every X. OK, yes. so we are going to use that. So suppose further that F is complex measurable. All those conditions are true as in Lucene and mod F is less than or equal to one. We are going to claim that there exist functions GN and CCX such that can you guess the statement? With mod GN less than or equal to one, can you guess the statement? Given F, I've got a sequence. So what could be the statement? G is F is. F is equal to G N. No, then what is the point of N? Limit, limiting case. Out, limiting outside case. on a side. Limiting way. case. Limiting case. Yeah. No, this is the proof. So forget this. I'm going to say that F equal to limit G N. Yes. But I'm going to apply Burrell Cantilly, which is an almost every statement. So I'm going to my claim is that F equal to limit G N. Almost everywhere, meaning F X equal to limit G N X almost everywhere. So this is the proof by Lucene you apply for each n you will get a gn and how do you get mod gn less than or equal to one because of that inequality in Lucene. Supremum of mod gn is less than or equal to supremum of mod f which is less than or equal to one such that mu of en, en I'm defining this set fx not equal to gn this mu is less than one by two power n. Does this en satisfy the hypothesis of Burrell Cantilly? What is summation mu e n? Finite. One, no, summation one. mu e n is one, so that is one. finite. Mm -hmm. Therefore, by Burrell Cantilly, almost every x lies in at most finitely many of these sets e n. Agree? This is Burrell Cantilly. So, any such x, if you take an x which lies at most in finitely many of these sets, that means what? fx equal to gnx for all large enough n, right? 
because fx not equal to g n x only finitely many of those sets this x belongs. So beyond that finitely many, beyond that all the sets fx not equal to g n x is not true. That means fx equal to g n x. Agree? Yeah. Yes. So this is true, which means fx is limit gnx, no? Because beyond the state gnx is same as fx. So limit gnx is fx almost That's everywhere. It. Why almost everywhere? Because this property is almost every x. Okay, so it's a nice application of Lucent together with Burrell Cantilly, and we will stop here. This chapter has just one more theorem, which is called the Vitali Carathenori theorem, and we will do that on Friday. Okay. So Friday also we will have a one hour class like this, a small class and we will go very slow and uh, we will do that and uh, then we will go to chapter three. Okay. So let me okay. stop sharing the screen. And stop sharing and we can also, any quick comment or something, this chat message is earlier one, yeah. And I can also stop recording.